So I'm coming really from a financial perspective. You know, the prompt was, you know, AI will make financial markets more efficient. Yes, no, or just kind of what's in my context of the way I was thinking about it is, well, what is finance for anyway? And can computers do it? That's obviously a very glib way of thinking about what we're going, what's going on. But, you know, it's kind of amazing. And I think that the, um, the organizers deserve some credit for how well finance was so um, was captured by the two papers today. Um, Roxana did this a little bit in hers too. It's kind of, we really got the two pieces of the two big uh, hats or umbrellas that finance folks at business schools or in um, departments would wear. They'd be either the asset pricing or corporate finance hat. And all of us, you know, typically wear one hat or the other. Sometimes we scurry between the two of them, but these are the two big ones. These are our two big flagship um, journals. Kind of, these are the two topics. And kind of really the, the, at the risk of being very general about what's going on here is that I think the two papers are capturing distinct thoughts about how AI will affect finance. So one is about how firms respond and adjust to the risks that they face. So that's this, um, there was this paper by um, Bates, Du and Wang that was thinking about kind of corporate finance is this concept of there are risks and that has economic consequences on how firms structure their balance sheets, how they behave, that's corporate finance and sort of how the funding of that happens. And so then we wanna think about, well, what's the implication of how AI will interact with that? Um, that obviously is a very corporate finance kind of question. And then, you know, there's this question more generally of, well, if we think about asset pricing, how does AI affect pricing and hence the allocation of credit in credit markets? So the reason why we care about asset pricing beyond just wanting to make money is so that, that joke um, you're making about, well, how are you making money off of this is the reason an economist would say that they care about asset pricing is, well, what we care about is getting the prices right so that credit is allocated efficiently. And that was this... Um, this paper uh, by Kao Jiang, Wang, and, uh, and Yang. And so, um, you know, I kind of want to just go through the two of them. They're going to touch on things that are going to be similar, but I just kind of want to go through. So in this, in this first paper um, by Bates and all is that like, there's a lot of pieces here. And earlier today, we were talking about labor issues um, given with AI, but if we just purely focus, we can just purely focus on the finance aspect of it without getting into the labor and still have a lot of interesting things to dig into. And the one thing I would say to the authors that I think would be interesting is that there's this broader point in which AI kind of engages with the minimum wage literature, which is obviously becoming a huge deal, which is about the extent to which capital, when does capital respond to changes in the minimum wage? So papers by um, Dan Aronson et al. and, and Isaac Sorkin um, have kind of touched on this. But the risk, what I want to talk about is in the Bates, Du, and Wang paper is that there's this idea that the what the AI is solving for the firm, the thing that minimizes risk is this idea that there's an exposure to risk that incomplete credit markets fail to solve, right? It's this idea that labor is inflexible, there are shocks, and we can't draw on credit or it's too expensive, and so we need cash around to hedge against this risk, right? That's the whole idea behind this. It comes up in a lot of settings. It comes from this idea of incomplete credit markets. And as a result, if we sort of fix that inefficiency coming from the labor, from labor by having some sort of um, labor replacement, that now it's going to be more efficient since cash can be used for investment or for dividend payments. And what's interesting is about this is that this kind of mirrors all the concerns about how does AI create value. Pasquale was kind of talking about this as like, what are we doing with AI? Is it that AI creates more investment or opportunities or is it just paying out more dividends? And so this is the tension here that's showing up in a kind of another example is that they have more cash that they can get rid of now on every period sort of getting revenue and then they can give it out or they can invest it. The question is obviously, what are they doing? The paper really only finds evidence for dividends, but that's typically because it's very challenging to find changes in investment um, on a, at a small scale. But the other side of the coin that I wanted to highlight, which is this fact that, yes, it's true that basically um, it's reducing this risk exposure, but is it creating other new kinds of risk exposure? So this is my question here is that so fine. So you get rid of this labor risk exposure, but AI hasn't inherently fixed the risk from having imperfect capital markets, right? You still have these banks that aren't willing to give you loans because of whatever um, imperfections in the market. And are there new shocks that are a consequence of being a very AI-centric firm? So do you need to purchase upgrades? So think about this as like in a labor force, when you all of a sudden need to change your labor force composition, this is a type of shock that you might have or scaling up and down. 
you know, there may be things that you need to do as a firm. And are you going to be susceptible to hold up problems from the supplier of your AI capital? So if you think about this, once we start thinking about this as a competitive market where now you have to buy certain types of capital from certain types of producers, that's going to be a form of new source of risk. And if the capital markets are still imperfect, which it's not obvious why AI is going to fix that per se, then that's just, just going to change the type of financial exposure that we see. So on net, it may be an overall gain for these firms, but I think in a lot of the thought process here is that there's this unexplored source of risk here to consider and the competitive nature for these AI markets, who's providing it, like how concentrated the, prov the providers of AI is, um, that's going to be really important for thinking about how big of a risk this is. So that's kind of on the corporate side. I think that basically the point here is to say the way we think about corporate finance is we're exposed to types of risk and we think about how firms have to respond when we get closer to things being perfect markets, that's going to fix it. But now we can turn kind of to asset pricing. And in asset pricing, the idea is that you've, you focus on factors that determine prices. And so in a lot of models of rational asset pricing, information plays a huge role. And so the obvious point um, in today's paper was to say how AI can play a really important role for improving information aggregation, right? For things that are routine, like highly liquid stocks or things where we see a lot of information. And this is really consistent with the literature that talks about inattention. So this is actually, if you go back in macro, right? This is, there's this nice literature thinking about macro asset pricing that Chris Sims basically says, look, we can think about rational inattention. It's this idea that people have finite information processing, and as a consequence, that's gonna have really big important implications for macroeconomics. You know, his, in his handbook chapter about this, he says something along the lines of, everyone ignores or reacts sporadically or imperfectly to information. Most days I take no action at all based on the information I viewed. If you ask me a half hour after I looked at a paper, what were the numbers I viewed, I'd be at best be able to give a rough qualitative answer. It's basically this idea like, we're just finite in our ability to process things. And so that seems like a pretty great case for an efficiency win. You know, robots don't sleep. So we get a lot more efficient aggregation of information. It would be a lot, it's kind of, I think a nice thing the authors should think about. It's straightforward to kind of embed how these AI technology changes would show up. Um, when you think about, this is a very nice paper by Juan and Liu about how rational inattention affects portfolio allocation. And we know that inattention matters for asset prices. So Marina Nestner has a bunch of papers where what they show is basically that firms try to kind of give information at times when people aren't paying attention. So like when you have bad news, you give it out on Friday because nobody's paying attention on Friday and they go home. And the federal government is excellent at this. Typically, you know, if you really want to sandbag something in the media cycle, you go out on, on Friday or a time when people are not paying attention. That's a very natural kind of human aspect. And one would imagine that AI wouldn't suffer from that in the same way. I think the one caveat that I would like to highlight for the authors, um, because they didn't talk about it in the paper, is that even if the sort of machine is doing well, you kind of have to think about like, they're saying one way in which the machine is doing well, but it, it's, it is important to think about what is the right loss function to put over types of predictions. So what types of earnings do you want to get right or wrong? And is there covariance in how you get things wrong? And so that would affect portfolio allocation. I just want to kind of flag that for the authors, because that's sort of a first order thing that comes up in this setting. So. You know, in the asset pricing setting, I'm kind of saying, okay, well, I think this, it, the answer is pretty much yes. I emailed a friend who's the hedge fund manager. His response was, I think the answer is pretty clearly yes. AI has already been very huge. He kind of highlighted all the same things that I had in mind for this inattention, automatic scraping of earnings releases, machine learning tools help sort through publicly inf available information, credit card and other sources of data fed into AI high frequency algorithm trading. Like this has all been sort of really important in financial markets already. And it's not that new in the sense that quant firms have been at it for 20 plus years. I kind of pushed him a little on this and I said, well, you know, what about competition or other types of things? And, you know, in his view is it's, it's really hard to train quant models for black swans. And in terms of competition, there may be crowding, which is going to create kind of volatility. Um, so I think there's this element to which there's going to be some amount of basically competition or collision in terms of who's working on what. And so I think the last point that this, this asks is that as more people are doing this in financial markets, this may create what are called factors in the market. So there's this element to which um, Adrian, Itula, and Muir have this paper, and there are a number of follow-ups that basically say intermediaries, intermediaries like banks play a big role in pricing 
assets. As we get more and more AI, this may create new risk factors if people start to move in kind of the same way. So it seems this may offset slightly the benefits. Um, it seems like a big deal. The other big problem is, of course, these black swans or the question of, is somebody going to be at the wheel when we see things that we haven't seen before? Um, I'm out of time. So the, the comment that I just want to end on here is that you know, so I went to Swarthmore and our economics department's t-shirt was valuing equity over efficiency since uh, 1863. I have a paper with Fuster and co-authors that argues that efficiency improvements can maybe have disparate impacts and have equity issues. The pricing of risk is very complicated. And so, you know, that's something to really keep in mind about all of these things. You know, the common argument for efficiency is we can do transfers, but it's going to be kind of important to think about how we can do so. So thanks a lot.